I am Dr. Jagdeep Kaur Garewa, Chairperson, Department of Art History and Visual Arts, Punjab University, Chandigarh. This module deals with two very significant artists who are acknowledged as pioneers of modernism in India, Jamini Roy and Amrita Shelgil, whose evolution from the influences of Western art to the development of an art that was distinctly Indian in its form and content is discussed in detail. The approach and work of these two artists, who are among the seminal contributors to a modernist language, reveals the changes emerging in Indian art in the 20th century. The work of Jabani Roy, who takes inspiration from folk art, presents an indigenous modernism. The work of Amrita Shergil, who drew from Western modern art, as also Ajanta murals and Pahari miniatures, to arrive at a personalized, synthesized art is significant in the context of the influences transmitted to her contemporaries. Now we'll begin to discuss Jamini Roy. Among the celebrated masters of the modernist approach in the 20th century is Jamini Roy. He hailed from a village in the Bankara district and belonged to a minor landlord family. His early upbringing in rural Bengal did foster his familiarity with the tribals of the area who featured in his early work and also made it easier for him to return to his roots in art and life later. He joined the art school in Kolkata in 1906 and trained in academic art in which he gained great proficiency. After school, he worked for a while at odd jobs, tinting broadsheet, woodblock prints, and later joined a letho press in Allahabad as a stone retoucher. On his return to Kolkata, he worked as a portraitist and painted landscapes. His early work was in the academic style. By this time, he also began to strive for a personal style, initially along the lines of the Impressionists and Forms. These imagined landscapes were painted in encrusted pigment with attention paid to light and space. In these works, his focus is essentially on composition and textured surfaces built up in colour. Krishna Chaitanya is of the opinion that a fresh evaluation of these works is needed as in the general alienation from everything Western, these works were too easily dismissed. He goes on to say that there is nothing Eastern or Western about naturalism. In the early phase, he also painted works in watercolours, oils and tempera, in which the themes were the same as that of the revivalists. Woman at her toilet, mother and child, people at worship, though the style was not the same. Even as his brush created the effect of the wash, the colours were vastly different. During this period, he was painting Santhal women or women from the working classes. In Mother and Child, done in 1930, the contours of the figures are well defined, with the contour line moulding the form and tonal gradations employed to create volume. Gradually, Jamini Roy came to the realisation that he was not moving in an individualist direction and this led to a crisis of identity from which emerged the impulse to look beyond European influences. By the mid-1920s, he began to turn towards indigenous influences, particularly to the folk traditions of Bengal. Binoy Kumar Sarkar is of the opinion though that Jamini Roy was not a folk painter as in his case, the primitivism came via Europe. Scholars are of the opinion that a reintroduction to his own traditions happened through the ages of Gagnendranath Tagore, who had commissioned Roy to copy a portrait of Devendranath Tagore. Gagnendranath had been an avid collector and his collection had specimens of Bengal folk art, but a painting. Kaligat paintings,
Kantha work. This led to Jamini Roy's return to the environment and traditions that had been part of his childhood in Bankara. Krishna Chaitanya puts it well that Jamini Roy went back in his memories to his early environment and its culture as he continued to live in Kolkata. This marked the most original and productive phase of his career. His practice was now derived from the village craftsmen. He gave up canvas and began to prepare his own painting surfaces out of cloth, wood and mats that were coated with lime. He began to use tempera colours instead of oils and the pigments were mineral or vegetable colour. Krishna Chaitanya states that the colours were usually limited to seven. Indian red, yellow ochre, cadmium green, vermilion, grey, blue and white. Of these, the first four were obtained from local rock dust, vermilion was made from sindhur, grey was alluvial mud, blue from indigo, white from common chalk, lamp, black was black. The priming of the cloth was done with mixture of mud and cow dung, followed by a coat of lime wash. An issue that arose out of these practices later was the relative instability of the surface, leading to a deterioration of the work. His forms and motifs now came to be derived from folk motifs. Inspiration was taken from putter paintings, toys of Bankara and Kaligat paintings, as seen in the large eyes, large head and frontal aspect of the figures, as also the bold simplicity, linear rhythm and lyricism in his work. Parthamitra records that soon he was to reject Kaligat artists for having lost the rural ideal as they were based in an urban environment and that by the mid-1920s he had embarked on his epic journey to the Bengal countryside to collect folk paintings and to learn from the folk painters. As his art began to evolve, three phases are identified. In his earliest adaptations from the folk influences, he created simple forms that were derived from Kaligat paintings. There are paintings such as Cat with Fish in Mouth, closely based on Kaligat works. Even the depiction of women draped to draw attention to the contour, the sweeping line defining form and the rhythm of the line are derived from Kaligat works. Roy's work though has greater elegance, his forms acquire a stylization and do not exhibit the monumentality seen in Kaligat painting. His early work also has almost no colour. In these, in his aim for formal simplicity, he emphasised line at the expense of colour and he concentrated on primary colours as stated by Partha Mitta. The next phase of his work shows greater maturity as colour is introduced in his paintings and it is a bright palette and the colours are used flatly in an opaque manner. The forms are now more emphatically defined by strong black lines. A degree of detail and delicacy are brought in through the use of dots and lines used in decorative patterns, usually in black, vermilion or white. The figures are now grouped together and also at times partially depicted, such as just the heads are shown. Space in his paintings does not exist as all elements are grouped together in the frontal plane.
the figures are flattened and tightly pressed into the composition. Even if a narrative is depicted, necessitating the inclusion of a number of figures, the figures at the back are raised above those in the frontal plane. In the last phase, the brightness of the color palette and its color range reduces considerably, marking a return to a colorless, subdued palette. In Krishna Chaitanya's view, there is extensive rehandling of the pictorial language of the parts in the paintings of his final phase. Now there is greater emphasis on the brushwork and some degree of emotive qualities are also expressed. By about 1935, Roy's work had begun to be noticed. In 1937, a major retrospective exhibition secured his reputation with Shahid Suharwardi hailing the show first rate and of great importance to modern Indian art. By the 1940s, his reputation as among the pioneer artists in the country was well established as evidenced by the critical successes of his exhibitions in 1941 and 44. His work is strongly motive centric and many times the design is repeated in many pictures. He also emphasized the collective nature of folk art practices signing works in which he had given some finishing touches or just providing the pictorial design for the painting to be made by others who worked with him. This raised the question of originality, of the vision of an artist, of the artwork and the value attached to an artwork. Germany Roy justified this approach citing folk and other traditions where such works were not necessarily unique. In this regard, Parthamitta says that through the folk idiom, Roy sought to restore the collective function of art and thereby disavow artistic individualism and what Walter Benjamin calls the aura of a work of art, the hallmarks of colonial art. In the process, he radically recast indigenism, the nationalist paradigm. He also goes on to underline how in the 1920s, the definition of nationhood had begun to shift from the pan-Indian to the local and that Jamini Roy's art presents the most radical expression of local identity in opposition to the pan-Indian historicism of the Bengal school and how he employed the notion of the village community as a weapon of resistance to colonial rule. Now we come to the next artist uh, under discussion in this module, Amrita Shergil. Born on 30th January 1930 in Budapest, Hungary, to a Hungarian mother and a Sikh aristocrat father, Amrita from an early age showed an interest in fine arts. Her family had a cultural bent as a father, Umrao Singh, was a photographer and a scholar in Sanskrit and Persian, and her mother, Marie Antoinette Gotsman, was a musician. She was surrounded with paintings and artifacts since childhood. Her parents had an interesting collection of Hungarian masters, expensive carpets, wood carvings from Java, pictures in ivory frames, gold and silver objects, and ornate silver Kashmiri frames, and so on. Coming from a mixed racial background, Amrita grew up with a broader perspective of life and a multicultural exposure. Amrita first came to India when she was eight years old in 1921. The family lived mostly at Shimla and Saraya, the village in Gorakhpur district on the family estate. Their house was full of books and this developed early reading habits in Amrita. She had read Dostoevsky, James Joyce and D.H. Lawrence at an early age and this played an important role in the growth of her personality. The earliest drawings of Amrita that we come across were done by her between the age of 11 to 14 years. These drawings are done in a childlike manner, but even in these, her slant of mind becomes visible. 
She was very fond of solitude and often in her paintings we come across this feeling. In letters to her cousin and future husband, Victor Egan, from 1931 to 35, she writes about her solitary nature which was apparent to her parents and a cause of concern. She had an introspective mind which is also reflected in her paintings. Amrita's personality is quite visible in her works. In 1926, Irvin Bhakte, her uncle, visited the Shergill family in India. An Indologist, who had been a painter, he on seeing Amrita's talent suggested she draw from live model. In India, Amrita had studied art under Hall, Devin, Petman and Whitmarsh. Petman suggested that she should go to Europe to get her formal training in art. In 1929, Amrita moved back to Europe and did not come back till 1934. In Europe, she went to Paris, where initially she learned art at the Académie de la Grande Chaumière under Professor Pierre Vaillant and later in 1930 joined École Nationale des Beaux-Arts. In Paris, she became familiar with Western modern art and her works from this period, like Young Girls, show significant influence of this. In this painting, Amrita has depicted two women, an artist and her model, seated, facing each other in conversation. One of them is holding a palette and the other appears to be topless. Done in the medium of oil paints, Western influence in style and theme is apparent in this picture. This painting won a gold medal at the Grand Salon in 1932. Between 1930 and 1932, Amrita made hundreds of sketches and studies of female nudes. In these, her material is primarily charcoal and also oils. She also painted self-portraits and portraits of her sister and other people around her. In one of her letters to Victor, she mentions about painting a sister Indu and a good nude. There is a similarity of effect in the figure studies and her self-portraits, including nude self-portraits. She repeatedly painted Marie Louise, a middle-aged model with whom she shared a studio in Paris. In the depictions of Marie, a feeling of ennui comes across. Amrita was a great admirer of the Hungarian poet Adi. His theme of death and fleeting time were transposed onto her paintings. When she was in Paris, most of the major art movements of the early 20th century, like post-impressionism, fauvism, cubism, surrealism, etc., had taken place. Out of it all, the most impact on her was of the post-impressionists, especially of Gauguin's sonorous colors and Cezanne's concern with pure form. Both these were in tune with her and she turned to them instinctively. During a stay in Paris, her work shows the search for pure form and pure orientation of colours. She wanted to create paintings in which there was no other concern other than pure harmonious quality. This is the European in her and being an Indian, she wanted significant content as well. This remains a dilemma and the major characteristic of her painting. For content, she turned to India and wrote, Europe belonged to Paris, Matisse and Braque, where India belongs only to me. She also said, I want to come to India to describe the life of the poor Indians, not the picture card poor, but tiller of the land. Amrita, in a sense, has a humanistic concern which derives from Western thinking. She also found another excuse to come to India, by describing Europe as cold and deprived of colour and finally came back in 1934. She believed her destiny as a painter lay in India. Her homecoming words show she was immediately touched by the dark bodies, sad faces, incredibly thin men and women who move silently, looking almost like silhouettes and over which an indefinable melancholy reigns. On coming back in her first year in India, she painted a large number of portraits of her family and friends, which can be seen in works such as The Three Sisters. The 
This is a time she also painted very sentimental and romantic versions of Indian poverty in works like Mother India and Beggars. Shimla was the main place of her stay in India and she found a lot of inspiration there and worked with great intensity. From this period, Partha Mitter identifies Man in White as one of her most striking works, stating that its unusual power lies in the diagonal structure that imparts the figure great monumentality. In these works, he finds a flat style reminiscent of Gauguin, as seen also in some of her significant works like Hillmen. and Hill Women. That were painted during her stay in Shimla around 1935. There is a statesque quality in these figures. They are reduced to geometric shapes, but soft lines of drapery gentle the forms. During this time, she also developed a specific facial type with oblong faces, with very soulful eyes. There is a type of introspective quality in these faces, with their large eyes, dark and angular faces, and pouting lips. It is almost as if she identifies this face with her own feelings. In these figures, she's achieved a simplicity of forms and a bold stylization. This facial type would be seen in much of her works till 1937. Amrita also started to paint in transparent glazes placed one on other almost like watercolors. In 1936, she travelled to Bombay where she met Karl Khandalwal. He showed her Rajasthani and Pahari miniatures, especially Basoli miniatures. She was dazzled by these and was impressed by their aesthetic ethos. It was as if her eyes were opened to Indian aesthetics. A seed was sown at that time which greatly enriched her work later. When she visited Ajanta in Elora, she said, Revelations, Elora magnificent, Ajanta curiously subtle and fascinating. I have for the first time since my return to India learned something from somebody else's work. In 1937, she visited South India, Hyderabad, Trivandrum, Cochin and Madurai. There she saw sculptures, performances of Kathakali, her entire concept was changed by this journey. She now sensed beauty in most pedestrian forms and she was to say, I am finally learning restraint. Before this, she had been too emotionally involved in the subject, especially to portray the essence of the subject. During the tour, she painted a small work, Fruit Vendors, that clearly shows the visual impact the people and landscape of Kerala had on her. A wonderful contrast of the white garments and the dark complexioned figures against an emerald green background imparts a jewel-like quality to the work. Ajanta became a significant influence on her image at work. Geeta Kapoor states, it is possible that she was drawn to Buddhist art and especially Ajanta for the way in which it transfigures Buddhist humanism into a sublime aesthetic. Her figures now acquire greater poise and immense dignity with the quality of plasticity. She also developed a greater understanding of the country and its people and character to the subjects. As Geeta Kapoor states, now the mode of stylization also becomes a mode of interpreting a given subject, which constitutes the content of the work. This is visible in some of her finest paintings done in 1937. The Bride's Toilet, The Brahmacharis, and South Indian villagers going to the market. These are large-sized works. The Brahmacharis, considered to be 
one of her most startling and successful paintings. Her greater familiarity with the Indian environment is immediately visible in the authenticity of character and the subtle differentiations between the characters who now belong to a specific social context specified by hints of dress and habit. This work and the others show a balance between realism and a wonderful lyrical stylization. A masterly composition, this work imbues the figures with immense dignity and the painting depicts a subtle harmony of colors heightened by touches of contrasting color. It is in this work, After the Hill Men, that she again achieves an amalgamation of form and theme involving significant content. By this time, the figures in her paintings either fill the entire picture space or are small forms in that space. In June 1938, she left for Hungary and there married her cousin, Dr. Victor Egan, and was away for almost a year. There she continued to work and what is immensely interesting is that these works are different from the work she was doing in India, as these exhibit a European character in colour, mood and sensibility, though different from her earlier work in Paris. During her stay in Hungary, in the medieval village of Zebegne, she came across the work of naive or folk artists and became interested in their work and that of the leader of the populist school, Istvan Sozny. Here she also discovered Bruegel the Elder and her work, Hungarian market scene, is termed rather Bruegelesque. On her return, she visited Ceylon and then Mahabalipuram and Mathura, where she saw Kushan sculptures. Initially, she and her husband stayed at Saraya in Gorakhpur and she became involved in the cloistered life of the women in the feudal setup. The important paintings of the last phase were done mostly in 1940 and include works such as Woman Resting on Charpai, The Ancient Storyteller, The Bride, Elephant Promenade, Haldi Grinders, and The Swing, among others. In Woman Resting on Charpai, the figure fills almost the entire picture plane. Geeta Kapoor states that even as we look down at her, the restful pose reflects an inner turmoil of suppressed desires. She terms it to be a consciousness of the restraints imposed on her by the social environment. By this time, the influence of the Indian miniatures, particularly of the Basali school, had brought a greater intensity to her palette, seen in the jewel-like warm reds and oranges employed. In the ancient storyteller, the figures are small in size in the courtyard, the walls of which are defined by the use of brilliant white that frames the scene. Here, she pictures the steady flow and rhythm of a rural household as the young audience leans in interestedly to hear a story. Here, quiescence expresses different shades of feelings. Amrita had a great love for pure colour, and in Indian painting, that is what appealed to her senses the most. In 1941, Amrita and Victor shifted to Lahore. Before shifting to Lahore, she had visited the city and also put up an exhibition of her works in November 1937. This exhibition was reviewed by Charles Fabry, writing for the Civil and Military Gazette, who had given a favourable review of her works. 
Regarding this, Ratan Parimu points out, he was the first critic to say in a Lahore newspaper that Amrita Shergill was the greatest artist India possessed, representing a possible way of harmonizing tradition with modernity. Fabri found Amrita's paintings ripe compositions and also pointed out simplicity as a keystroke. She found Lahore to be a perfect city to practice her art and also where Victor could do his medical practice. It was also the place where she breathed her last. Ironically, within a short period of her death, her art started getting due appreciation from the critics. Amrita Shegil was an artist of distinction, but her peers criticized her Western roots, which they believed influenced her art, hence making it un-Indian. Amrita, on the other hand, not only remained undeterred in the face of criticism, but she strongly criticized most of the leading artists of the time. The importance of Amrita Shergill can be seen from the artists who were influenced by her, such as B.C. Sanya, who saw her works in Lahore, and also non-Punjabi artists such as K.K. Heber, who acknowledged the influence in a work titled Homage to Amrita Shergill. Although she was criticized for approaching India as a foreigner, like Gauguin was motivated by the exoticness of Tahiti. However, later on, W.G. Archer pointed out that she was the first significant Indian artist to paint rural poor as a main subject. Post her death, she emerged as one of the most significant artists of modern India, and her work became the inspiration to a new generation of artists, such as the Calcutta group. Partha Mitha states that her energy and originality had begun to have an impact in India quite early on. He goes on to underline that Shergill successfully asserted her independence in a male world, carving out a central position in Indian modernism.